Joining us now to expand on this topic is Christopher Palsay, the author of White Fragility, Debating the Effects of Whiteness Studies on America's Schools and a Philadelphia School Teacher. So, Chris, when we really look at what this whole topic is about, I mean, critical race theory, it's something that I think gets thrown around a lot, but really at the heart of it, what is it and what does it intend to do? Critical race theory is a really complex topic. It's hard to just pin it down with one definition. I think uh, you look at it, there's some aspects of it that are well-meaning. I think there's groups that really care. They want to try and bring about you know, racial justice. And then there's other parts to it that um, groups want to drive an agenda, just like you talked about. There's definitely parts of it where it's, it's all about politics. It's not about education. It's about teaching kids uh, what to think, not how to think. Um, there's definitely an agenda attached to it. And... Um, you know, it's something that parents need to pay attention to because in certain situations, I like to say there's a sliding scale between reasonable and radical. And if your child's in a school where it's reasonable, they're trying to teach things like Martin Luther King's dream in terms of, you know, judging a person by the uh, content of their character, not the color of their skin, which interestingly is not being taught anymore because that's called colorblind racism. But that that would be more reasonable. And then there's the other side of it where it's more radical where you see school districts like um, in Seattle and Cupertino, California, there was that third grade class where the children were taught to deconstruct their identities in third grade, and that's more radical. So it depends. I, it, I don't want to paint it with a broad brush because I believe in, you know, I believe in, you know, racial justice. Yeah. I believe people mean well, and I believe a lot of it, you know, means well. But then there's another part to it. People take advantage, and underneath, there's definitely an agenda, and I think it's left of center. Something yeah, and- like you know. Yeah, and you know, you bring up a good point because I do think that it's very important for us to know about our history so we avoid mistakes in the future. But a lot of people say that part of this curriculum is tearing apart that history so you can almost rewrite it and apply it moving forward. I mean, I do think that children should be taught about, for example, the early days of slavery in the United States, how it played a role in this country. But I I think that where it goes wrong is when they almost try to apply the blame to the kids a little bit, uh, try to make them accountable for the actions of the misgivings and the bad deeds of people a couple hundred years ago. So who is implementing this? Is it something that comes down from teachers unions? Does it come down from the government? Is it individual teachers? Who has the discretion to decide what is appropriate to teach in schools and what is inappropriate? That's a good question. I think parents need to pay attention at two levels. There's the district level, where districts, obviously, they have to go to the school board and approve the curriculum, and certain districts will approve certain things. And a lot of times it sounds really well-meaning, um, and it does mean well. But then there's the other part to it where the te- uh, parents have to look at what's going on in the classroom, because just because you have a certain curriculum in your school, teachers sometimes, you know, they have certain leeway and they bring this in. So um, I think it's coming from the district, and sometimes you could say rogue teachers, they'll, they'll kind of, they won't follow exactly the curriculum, and they'll decide to bring things in. And sometimes it's well-meaning, but I think the whole overall idea of critical race theory and a branch of it is called anti-racism. It sound, again, anti-racism sounds great. People right. want to stop racism. But when you look at the, the way it's being done, we, we, we all have the same goal, but we have different methods for getting there. And I think when you're polarizing kids by race, you're dividing kids into identity groups. You have, you know, th- literally you're saying whites are privileged, they're inherently racist, and then you're saying that people of color are oppressed, they're inherent victims, they're not the captain of their own ship. I think when it gets into that, I think it's it's tragic because instead of really seeing how we're the same, I think it, it focuses on too much how we're different and it polarizes us. And, you know, this is actually a conversation that I have with a lot of my progressive friends as well. Uh, They oftentimes are trying to uh, convince me of their policy positions. But what I tell them where they go wrong is that sometimes they view the whole world through a lens of America being bad, and that's it. And I think that that is problematic to the average person. I think many people know that this country is inherently good, the people of this country are inherently good, and they strive to be even better, which I think is what really makes this country great. But when you call and blanket statements, as you were saying before, I don't think you can talk about an absolute loots in anything. So when you're saying that, for example, um, all white people are to blame or something like that, or saying that children need to be uh, indoctrinated in some certain way, is this a type of policy that just stokes more divisions than it does, than really find the commonalities that you were talking about, and also further along their understanding of how to think? I think it does. I think it literally, again, I don't want to paint with a broad brush because some of it's well-meaning in certain places. Some is more reasonable, some is more radical, but the more radical elements, it definitely stereotypes. I remember when I grew up, it was wrong to stereotype. And Robin DiAngelo, the author of White Fragility, she says it straight up. She says, 
I, I stereotype and I, and I like to generalize and I like to generalize about white people and they have a privilege and if they don't realize it, it's going to perpetuate racism. And I think people are, are turned off by some of that. Now, there are some people who really agree with it. It's interesting because it almost seems as though people get very passionate about it. And I think it has to do with your politics. But I do think that um, a lot of teachers that I've talked to, some, some want to get involved the well-meaning ones do but then there's an aspect of it where you teach every day like i've been teaching for 25 years my students are a third white a third black a third latino and they're organically and naturally just colorblind they don't really see color they see it but it's like they move past it and they're just friends and then society's teaching them well you have to judge people by identity you have to be aware of identity and i get how we need to see race to, to help uh certain disparities but when you focus too much on race the question is when do you get past it. Hmm. And it seems like critical race theory, the, the answer is you never get past it because that's what it's all about, to stay focused on race because that's where the power is and that's where the agenda comes in. And it's unfortunate, you right. know? No, I, I think it's a really good point because, I mean, so often this country is uh, described as being a melting pot, but I, I actually don't think that's what it is. I think it's more so like a stew, if you will. Uh, all of these different things from different backgrounds, different cultures coming together to make something great, but you can still appreciate what they are individually without kind of, as you were saying, a, a, painting everything with the same brush, uh, talking in absolutes. I think that history and understanding is important, but it's about moving forward as a country. So I just wrote a book. It's called, um, the title of the book is called Exploring White Fragility, mm -hmm. Debating the Effects of Whiteness Studies on America's Schools. And this is like a toolkit that parents can use to kind of get educated about these issues. And I also have a YouTube channel for resources for parents if they want to uh, get educated. It's called, if you go on YouTube and you go into the YouTube search and you search inside white fragility, you can see resources for parents. It kind of goes against D'Angelo is white fragility. I mean, that's a great resource for a lot of people, especially right now when you can get it online. You could, don't have to go into the library or anything like that at this very moment. Uh, I know that a lot of places are locked down right now, schools included. But once again, Christopher Palzay, everyone go read that book. Thanks for joining us tonight, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate it.